37, if you want to follow with me in the Scriptures. And if you don't have a Bible with you, don't worry about that. We can just listen as we share God's Word. Psalm 37, please. It's a great psalm. It's the psalm of David, the man after God's own heart. And the Scripture reads, Fear not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thy envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnashes upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth, and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever mindful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell for evermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous, and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord, and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, 
but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Amen. We know the Lord indeed has already blessed the reading of his precious, precious word. I want to speak this morning on this psalm, and uh, I was thinking about particularly the Christian secret of a happy life. The Christian secret of a happy life. Isn't it wonderful to be saved and to say that you're happy in Christ? And we see here in this psalm that there's the contrast of the saint and of the wicked. The sinner and the saint, if you like, and the wicked. The Bible says here we can see the different estates of the godly and the wicked. That was one of the reasons why I read Psalm 1 this morning, because Psalm 1 talks about, Blessed is the man and the woman that walketh not in the, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the wicked, and sitteth in the seat of the scornful, and so on. He's a blessed man, he's a blessed woman who walks in the ways of God. And uh, David here, the great man of God, he wrote this tremendous psalm. Of course, it's written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he starts off here dealing with the very issue that trouble each and every one of us. He says, we're to fret not thyself because of evildoers. Uh, those of us who are parents and grandparents, when we turn on the news and when we hear what's happening uh, in our day and generation, we just think the world and society is out of control. The wicked seem to be abounding on every hand. Is there even a future for our children and grandchildren? And you know, when we turn to the Word of God, it's, it's God's Word that brings us as Christians comfort, hope, and consolation, knowing that the Lord, He is in control. And we have God's Word to bring us comfort in times like this. And even when everything seems so black at times and you can despair if you were to really let it get in on you. But the, the psalmist, he says here, fret not. We're not to fret. We're not to get distressed and uh, worry and anxious about the things that are going on. It doesn't mean that we're not concerned. Of course we are. It's natural to be concerned some people say, yes, it is even natural to worry, but you can't, as the saying is, worry yourself sick. I say worries like a rocking chair, it'll give you something to do, but it'll never get you anywhere. Uh, and worry, worry can really bring you down. I've shared this with a couple of you as in, uh, individually, but we live between two crosses. And the, the cross to the left, if you like, is the cross of the past. And we can be continually looking back at the failures and the regrets of the past. And uh, by thinking back on the past, it can really get us down. It can even nearly bring you into depression. But we can't change the past, and we can't live in the past, and the past is gone. And the tremendous thing about the Christian is when we are saved, the sins of the past are blotted out, but the memory's still there. When we get saved, God doesn't give us a new memory, but He cleanses our personality, He cleanses our hearts, and He has forgiven our past. But the old enemy, he would love to wreck up the past, dig it up. He's good at that. But according to the Word of God, the past is forgiven. So don't be uh, living in that past. 
because you can't change it. You can't alter it. It has happened. There are things in my life that I wished I had never done, but I can't change that. So that's the failures and the regrets of the past is one cross. And then the other cross that we live between is the fear of the future. What will the future hold for me? How will I cope? And uh, you're thinking perhaps of your children and your grandchildren, and you're considering yourself saying, what about tomorrow? What about the failures maybe of tomorrow? And as a result of that, it robs you of the joy of the present. It robs you of the joy of the present. The only thing that we're sure of is this moment. We're not sure about tomorrow. And certainly the past is gone. And so the Lord wants us to enjoy the moment, to enjoy Him, to put things into perspective. We cannot, there's no point in praying about the past because the past is gone. But the lovely thing is we can pray in the present and commit the future to the Lord. That's the wonderful thing. And I believe that's one of the great secrets of a happy life for a believer. I can commend my future, my grandchild, my children. I can commend. I can commend it all to the Lord. He's in control. And so that helps me as a Christian, even to put things into perspective about tomorrow. Yes, we, we plan for the future. That's, that's wise. But we're not to be worrying about the future. So the Lord wants us to enjoy the present. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. We're not to look to those that seem to be, you know, uh, doing well and they're doing bad. All the bad that's going on, these workers of iniquity, and you know, living in the province where we live, we could get consumed with the things of the past, but we're not to look to that. The Bible says in verse 2, For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Well, that green herb is like the grass that we cut. It, it withers, its strength goes. And you know, that's what happens. They have their day, and that's all they'll get. And so these wicked people, they, they'll have their day. They'll soon be cut down. And the Lord doesn't want us to, to, to get our eyes on them. The Lord says, get your eyes on me. That's the key. That's the secret to the happy life of the believer. Because he says here in verse, in verse 3, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. What, is, what does that mean? It means to put your whole confidence in Christ. Put your whole trust in is to put your whole confidence, every faculty, every fiber of your being with your mind, your intellect, and your will, you're putting all that trust that you have in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus. Put your trust in the Lord. You know, that's the greatest thing you can do for your future is to put and place your trust in the Lord, because to put your faith and trust in the Lord is to be safe. There's no safer place in the world than in Christ. Safe for time and safe for eternity. So I just want to ask you maybe here at the, at the outset of the little message, have you put your trust in the Lord? Have you come to that place where you're trusting Him with your whole heart? You can't change the past, but by trusting the Lord, you'll have the blessing of a bright future.
trust in the Lord. I'm glad I did that. And it'll be 30 years next Sunday. I'll be 30. I know you don't think I'm 30. It was spiritual birthday. Trusting in the Lord. That's the secret of a happy life, is to be trusting in the Lord Jesus. Put your confidence in him. And I see wonderful, wonderful promises here. David says, trust in the Lord and do good. In other words, live a, live a life for Christ. Do what's good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily or truly thou shalt be fed. So there's the assurance that we dwell where the Lord has placed us, and that we truly will not be in want. The Lord will meet our need. We know that when we come into the New Testament teaching how the Lord Jesus has provided all of that for us. So he says we're to trust in the Lord. And then verse 4, he says that we're to delight thyself also in the Lord. So as we're trusting in the Lord, then we're to delight ourselves in the Lord. What, is, what does that mean? You know, the Lord, the Lord didn't save us to, to rob us. The Lord saved us to bless us. He has come to put a smile on our faces. He has come to, to bring in joy to your hearts, the sense of His wonderful presence with us every day. And when we uh, delight ourselves in the Lord, we're enjoying this wonderful relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, He's an indwelling Savior. He's not an external Savior for the Christian. He's an indwelling Savior. He lives inside of us. That, that thrills me to think that the God who created everything, the God of infinite wisdom and knowledge, this awesome God of the universe that can't be reached by human hands or, speech, or spacecraft yet he's, he lives within my heart. That's an amazing truth by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that delights me, that thrills me to know that I have this wonderful relationship and this excites me. There's times I get excited about just being a Christian. Times I get excited uh, in preaching even when, you know, the Holy Spirit of the Lord that's in you, he brings that, that lovely joy and that wonderful thrill into your heart, and that excitement uh, of being saved. You remember, maybe when you were first just saved as a Christian, there was just that such excitement, and that joy, and that thrill of knowing that you were just saved, the joy of sins forgiven, that wonderful peace uh, in your heart when the Lord Jesus revealed Himself to you, that daily delight. And we don't want to lose sight of that. You don't want to lose that joy. Don't lose the joy of the Lord. Let Him be your constant, continual delight, because He says here that if we delight ourselves also in the Lord, He has promised here, and He says, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That's a wonderful promise. That's a promise from God that you can claim this morning as God's child. These, these promises here, uh, they're not for the ungodly. They're not for, as the psalmist says, they're for the wicked. These are for God's children. And God gives the best gifts. He delights to bless His children with the very best, and God knows how to do that. And, you know, it's wonderful and it's true he does give you the desires of your heart. When you uh, commit your way to the Lord, when you're praying about your future, there's things that, you know, you feel, well, if I had that, I'd be more happier. But our happiness is not in things. Our happiness is in Christ. He's the fulfillment of our life. And whenever whenever we're delighting in Him, He'll so come upon our hearts and we'll pray in the will of God. We'll pray for the things that are in God's heart and He will give us these. 
desires of her heart. It's not just here material blessings. Some people think, you know, that when you get saved, you can pray and God will give you all the material blessings. That's, this is not what the promise is. The desires of your heart can be the desires of living for Christ, the desires of seeing your family saved. I know one particular young girl, and her desire was always to be a missionary. And the Lord gave her the desire of her heart. And she is a missionary now. So there can be all sorts of wonderful desires, and yet he can also give you the desires of your heart in, in the workplace too. Maybe there are people who desire maybe to be a doctor, to be a nurse, to be a school teacher. But the whole secret is that is when you trust in the Lord and put him first, then he'll give you the desires of your heart. It's the Lord first. And then he'll give you these wonderful, wonderful desires. Delight yourself in the Lord. And then also, the psalmist says here, commit thy way unto the Lord. That's your future. You're living in between these two crosses. We're praying about our futures. So we are committing that in prayer. We are handing it over to God. The word here, when it talks about commit, it's that word that means to roll, to roll it over onto the Lord, just to, to commit it to Him. And uh, so we're praying about our future. We can commit that to the Lord in prayer and say, now, Lord, you, you guide my steps. There's also a lovely uh, verse in the Psalms where it talks about, Lord, choose my inheritance for me. So the Lord will choose our inheritance. He'll choose our future. He knows what's best. Remember whenever my little daughter Nikita, uh, when she just started the Sunday school and she was just there a few, a few months, maybe six weeks or so, and we asked her, what did you learn in Sunday school? We used to ask her that every week she went. She never said any, nothing. So she came home this Sunday and says, well, did you learn anything in Sunday school today? And, Nikita? and she said, yes. I says, That's, what did you learn? And she quoted this. She says, God knows what's best for us when we put him first in our lives. Wow. Thank God for Sunday school teachers. God knows what's best for us when we put him first in our lives. That's committing our way unto the Lord. Saying, Lord, you know what's best for my life. You have a plan. You have a future. You know what's best. You know, I had a plans for, for our children. I thought my son was going to follow in my footsteps and be a builder. And I gave him the brush one day and was showing him how to clean around the building site and around the houses. And after about an hour and a half, I went looking at him and couldn't find him. So I rang my dear wife, Molly, did you see Christopher anywhere? She says, oh, he's laying here watching television. <laughs> so I said to him, I says, son, I says, you'll never make a builder doing that. He says, daddy, I'm not going to be a builder. He had other desires. And his desires are better. You know, maybe you have plans for your children. Maybe you have plans for your grandchildren, what you'd like, but you know what? God knows best. And whenever we commit our ways to the Lord, He has promised them. He has promised to bring them to pass. He can bring it to pass. What does that mean? He can make it happen. You can't make it happen. Man's plans at the best are only plans at the best. But the Lord can make it happen. That's the difference. He can make it happen. When we commit our way unto the Lord, He has promised, make, putting Him first, He shall bring it 
the past. I, I love the, the, these wonderful promises of God. And he shall bring it to pass. It doesn't say here, he might. You know the way mommy would say, well, if you're good now, if you're, if you're a good girl, if you're a good boy now, you'll, I'll get you the treat. And they promised the treat, and then they weren't good. And you say, no, you're not getting it. You weren't good enough. But the Lord's not like that. It says he shall bring it to pass. You can trust the Lord. He keeps his word. He's faithful. He's honorable. He will bring it to pass. And so we go on to read then. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. There's another wonderful secret of the happy life of the believer, resting in the Lord. You know, we, we live in a restless world today, don't we? Uh, people are agitated. They're constantly going. If you listen to young people, sometimes you're driving up to the traffic lights and you hear this sound, you wonder what it is, and it's the car beside you, and the noise of the radio, boom, boom, boom. And they just can't rest today. They can't settle. They don't even know what it is to be still. Many, many people. But here the Word of God says we have to learn at times to rest in the Lord. It actually means to, to be silent. We live in a noisy world. Sometimes it's good as a Christian just to take your Bible, just have a nice wee quiet reading, put it on your lap, and just be quiet. Just sit still. Have you ever done that for a wee while? Maybe your house is just so busy that you just can't get that particular time. But if you can, just sitting still silently. We're used to going all the time. And you'll be amazed as you sit there and rest in the Lord. I have a reclining chair in my study, and sometimes I would do that and just sit on it and rest. And you know, as you're sitting there resting, the Lord will start to minister. The Holy Spirit will start to minister to you in that quietness, in that stillness, and He'll start to speak. Be still and know that I'm God. And as we spend time there resting in the Lord, then the Spirit of the Lord can speak when we're waiting. Sometimes we're too busy, you see, too, too engaged, and we miss out. And that's why it's important here. And this is what David, David is speaking from personal experience. This man knows what he's talking about. And he says to rest in the Lord, to be still. There's some lovely promises about resting. Think of that lovely one in Isaiah 26 and 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stead on thee, who's resting in thee. And then, of course, Psalm 46 and 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still, just sitting still, lying still, waiting still, and letting the Holy Spirit rest, that rest come to your mind. Sometimes our minds can be so active, they're just continually spinning, turning, going, thinking, planning, focusing. I remember that myself when, when I was at building you're trying to put your head in the pillow at night and get some sleep, and you're thinking about tomorrow's job and tomorrow's work and tomorrow's materials. 
but you learn you have to learn to just rest. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Because that's the next part of the verse. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. We find it difficult to do that, don't we? Waiting. We're not great when it comes to the patience. Sure we're not. Not everybody can cope with waiting and being patient. But it's a great virtue, there's no doubt about it. And it says here not only to wait on, but to wait patiently for Him. There are times when we would, we would just say, hey Lord, I, I wish you would hurry up a little here. I would need you to move at a wee bit faster pace for me. You're not just really going fast enough, Lord. There's a lot I want to do, and uh, there are things I need to be getting on with. And Lord, if you would just show your hand a wee bit, then I could move a little bit faster. But the Lord says, no, you have to wait patiently for Him. He spoke very, very clearly to me a number of years ago. Uh, I knew that God was calling me into full-time ministry, and he had given me that promise, and uh, I knew it was going to be future, and, and I was a wee bit impatient about that call. And I wanted it to happen sooner rather than later. But I had to learn to wait God's time. And the amazing thing about the Word of God is it's so precise because it speaks right into your situation. So you're praying about something, you're praying about your future, you're praying about a different situation. God has a particular word of Scripture that He can bring to that situation. And He spoke to me from Hebrews 10, 36. So clear, He says, for you have need of patience. Ye have need of patience. That just come with such part of me, and, and, and it was a rebuke. It was a rebuke to me. Because, you see, I wanted a fast track what... Uh, God wanted to put me on the slow track. But I wanted to fast track God's plans and I wanted to, you know, Lord, get, get, me, get me in here now. But God has a purpose. Listen to what um, the book of James says in relation about the lessons of patience. And here's what it says in James chapter 1 verse 2. He says, my brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, that means various trials, knowing this, that the, the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, we think that we are ready, and God knows we're not. And so we have to be patient with the Lord and let Him accomplish what He wants to accomplish. So the Lord lets these various trials come our ways, various tests, uh, so that our patience will turn into perseverance. Because perseverance, it says, accomplishes God's work in our hearts. So the Lord has a reason and a purpose why we have to wait on Him. We are not born with patience. We, do not, we don't inherit patience. We have to learn it. We have to be taught it. And God is the teacher. And patience then brings tremendous discipline in your life. If you, if you look at anyone who's a very patient person, you'll see another attribute beside that, and it's discipline. A patient person generally is a very disciplined person because they've learned the art of their patience most likely through discipline and trials. So this is, this is God's method, and uh, this is one of the reasons he says that in the psalmist here, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself, because of him who prospereth in his way, 
because of the man that bringeth wicked devices to pass. Let the Lord work it out. God says he'll, he'll sort it. He'll deal with it. He has it all under control. Sometimes we can get very angry about situations. Verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Sometimes people want to you know, take the thing into their own hands because of the see what's going on. But the Lord says we're not to do that because he says in verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off. They'll be cut off eventually. The Lord will deal with them. They'll be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Those that wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Remember what the Lord Jesus said in the Beatitudes, the meek, shall inherit the earth, those that are, that are saved, those that have repented, those that have trusted Christ. Cease from anger. Well, you know, you can't do that unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Anger is not of the Holy Spirit. Anger is a, it's of the flesh. It's of the, the old man, the old carnal man. He gets angry. He raises his head, and the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is able to suppress and hold that anger back. And so we're not to be angry. We're to leave it all with the Lord. And of course, he says here, there'll be in verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. This is another wonderful blessing for the Christian, the secret of the happy life is peace in the heart. Tremendous peace, even in the midst of storms, even in the midst of trials, we can have a peace, an abundant peace, just a sense of God that God's with us. Maybe you're going through a trial at the moment. Maybe you're going through a difficulty at the moment. And you know what? You can have a wonderful peace in your heart knowing that the Lord is with you and that the Lord works it out. Peace and contentment are two of the greatest blessings that a Christian possesses. Peace and contentment. You know, there's not a lot of people can say that today they're contented. Contented with their lot. Contented where they are contented with what they have, not striving to, for, if you like, to keep up with the Joneses, to use that old expression, but just so contented. Paul, he says that godliness with contentment is great gain, great gain. And uh, this contentment, it brings this peace that passes all understanding. It's lovely to be content. Paul the Apostle said, in whatsoever state I am, therefore I have learned to be content. He said he was contented when he had much, and he was contented when he had little or nothing. And that contentment comes with the peace of God. That peace that passes all understanding, that's a wonderful place to be, to have that contentment. Do you have that contentment this morning? That lovely peace of God that you're not worrying about tomorrow, you're enjoying the moment, you're stuck between these two crosses, that's life. And because of the concerns of tomorrow's robbing you of the contentment and joy of today. But we see here that God says there's ample provision for his children. Ample provision for his children. In verse 19, it says, They shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine. They shall be satisfied. You know, the Lord always looks after his own. We'll always have enough. He said that he never uh, seen the sheep 
God's sheep begging for bread. The Lord, there's always bountiful provision for God's children. This is the wonderful secret of the Christian's happy life. The Lord knows what we need. He knows the bills that are coming through the letterbox. He knows all we need. He meets the need. This is the wonderful thing. Ample provision. And very quickly, we see here in verse 23 here, divine guidance. I love this verse. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. The Lord delights in the man or woman's way that delights themselves in him. The steps of a good man, the steps of a good woman are ordered by the Lord. And we could add, and the Lord delighteth in his way. Isn't it wonderful to think that the Lord delights in the way you're walking? Walking for Christ, walking for the Savior, living for him. You're bringing delight to the heart of God. Wonderful to know that there's divine guidance. The Lord orders our steps. He orders them in the best possible places where he wants us to tread. And then uh, finally we see here that the Lord knows all about our life's experiences. In verses 25 right up to 28, he said here, I have been young. This is David speaking. He says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You dear friends that are <coughs> older saints in the Lord, that have walked with God a lot longer than I have, you can say amen to those verses. Whenever you were a young Christian, and now you're an older Christian, you've never known a time when the Lord forsook you, and you've never had a time when the Lord didn't meet your need. He's a wonderful Savior. He's a wonderful God. And this is the secret of the happy life. He leads us through every experience. He's with us in every circumstance of life, times of grief, times of sadness, times of exuberant joy. He's with us in every experience of life. And no matter who we are here today, we'll all go through them. Every one of us will go through every experience of life at one time or another. We face it. But it's great to know that we have the Lord with us. The Lord with us. And the key here for David, in verse 31 it says, The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. It doesn't mean that will not fall because David, we knew that he fell. In verse 24, it says, though he fall, you may fall as a Christian. It's possible to fall, but here's the lovely thing about it. It's not the end. Who here as a Christian has never fallen? We've all fallen. One degree or another, we're not perfect. But the Lord says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. The Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Isn't it great to know that he's holding us and we're not holding him? What a comfort. What a joy to be a child of the true and living God, to know that he holds our hand. And it says in verse 34 again, wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. The Christian's secret of a happy life is living your life for the Lord Jesus Christ and being daily in touch with him. Amen.